Here we are. So, so I'm just the chief building scientist. It's a little bit easier. <laughs> Although I guess when you go on all the rest of the stuff in my division and everything, you can get a lot. We're going to take team, and I will give an intro here to actually explain decarbonization, why you care, why you should care. I'm hoping to do this at a level that you can talk to your sixth grader or your mom or dad or grandma or grandpa and explain to them why we have to decarbonize. Um, so, we'll start. Carbon. Carbon. It's an atom. It's an element. Why is carbon bad? We hear carbon's bad. We've got to decarbonize. Well, carbon itself isn't bad. Carbon's in graphite. Ca carbon is in diamonds. Carbon is this thing that we, we it's, it's an essential part of life. We talk about organic chemistry is the chemistry that involves carbon, and carbon is a part of all life. So why is carbon bad? Well, carbon itself isn't bad. We have to have it. It's carbon in one of its other forms. When carbon gets into our body and we breathe in um, air and oxygen, our body uses whatever carbon's attached to for energy, and the carbon detaches from whatever its carrier is and connects up with the oxygen, and we export it or exhale it as carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is a gas. Carbon itself at room temperatures is a solid. So carbon dioxide is a gas, and that gas can get in the atmosphere, and that's what a little more problematic. But carbon dioxide is something we're breathing all the time, we're exhaling all the time. Is carbon dioxide bad? So it's just a couple molecules, carbon and a couple oxygen. We also know um, carbon dioxide in a solid form, dry ice. If I make it cold, I can make dipping dots out of it. It's a really great way to keep things cold. So carbon dioxide is Pretty simple stuff. And then maybe you've been hearing you gotta get rid of carbon dioxide. It's the problem is carbon dioxide the gas. And it's not just that it's there. It just happens to be the exact amount that we have in our atmosphere. So some carbon dioxide is good. Not only good, it's essential. Carbon dioxide is an essential part of regulating the temperature of our earth. Let's kind of talk about why CO2 is absolutely necessary. Why, when the very first uh, organisms, mo little molecules, started creating CO2, how that changed the world, and how life as we know it, or at least could come to be. Energy is a balance. We get energy, most of the energy from the Earth is coming from the sun. It comes and it comes in the form of light, visible light, some ultraviolet that we don't like, so we put on sunscreen. And also a lot of infrared. So we don't see it, but it makes us feel warm. That comes and it hits the Earth. So it hits the Earth, the Earth warms up. Anything that is above absolute zero, which is minus 400 and something degrees Fahrenheit, so that's not the very depths of space cold, also radiates energy. We don't see it as visible light. It's also called infrared, but it's, it's a little bit different. But radiate, we will radiate energy. That's one of the reasons when you get close to somebody, you actually feel heat. That's radiant exchange. When you are near somebody, it's really great to cuddle up. You feel that radiant heat. So the sun comes and the sunlight and sun infrared hits the earth. Earth is warmed up and it radiates back up into space. If we didn't have any CO2 or gases like CO2 in the atmosphere, the temperature of the Earth, the average temperature would be about minus five degrees Fahrenheit. And at minus five degrees Fahrenheit, that means at night, the sides of the Earth that are cold would get down to minus 200, 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And during the day, when the sun's directly hitting, it could get even warmer than it is now. It just is really cold, and life as we know it, in any way, shape, or form, can exist. But when the earliest organisms started creating CO2, there was a little bit of CO2 in the atmosphere, and the CO2 does something really special. It reflects back some of the infrared that would be coming off the Earth and going out into space. So the CO2 is important. It's absolutely essential for us to keep our Earth at a temperature that we can live with and, and, and we can um, grow. It keeps the coldest times of the, of the night from getting too cold, and it also actually helps regulate to things from, from getting too warm. 
will actually reflect some of the sunlight back out into space too. So sun CO2 is really important, but it's a really delicate balance. And over billions of years, a balance came to be such that there was just enough CO2 and similar gases in the atmosphere that the sunlight from the sun and the energy that we radiate balance out and we get to about 60 degrees temperature on average all over the Earth all the time, or thereabouts. So I talk about CO2, the sun is important. CO2 doesn't just mean CO2 though, it means a bunch of things that are all called greenhouse gases. And rather than say greenhouse gases all the time, we often just use the word CO2, carbon dioxide, or just carbon. So when we talk about decarbonization and getting rid of carbon, what we're talking about is getting rid of all of these things, CO2 and methane, nitrous oxide, and these carbons and fluorocarbons are things like in refrigerants that go in our refrigerator and air conditioners. Um, that's what we're talking about reducing the extra emission because that balance that's been going on has been thrown out of balance, that heat balance, because of us as humans putting out too much CO2, meaning all these things, into the atmosphere. So as I said, there's a balance. How much CO2 is enough? Well, we've had just enough for a long time. This is a little graph that shows the 10,000 years of carbon dioxide, what the level is. And you're gonna see the actual number here is between about 250 and 300, what's called parts per million. That would mean 0.002% or 0.02% to 0.03%. Really, very little, just a little bit. But it doesn't take much. Tiny bit in the atmosphere over the past 8,000 years um, you might say, how did somebody measure 8,000 years ago? We didn't have phones and sensors. You take samples of ice cores on glaciers and at the South Pole. And when you go down, you can time check the sample. And you can check the CO2 versus oxygen versus water level. And you can see how much CO2 was in the atmosphere when that year fall. That's how you tell. So, for the past 10,000 years, CO2 levels have been about... 260 to about 300 parts per million, not quite. And then, about 1800 or so, we had the discovery of coal as an energy source to spur the Industrial Revolution and for feeding steam generation and steam motors and steam engines, and it went into factories, and it went into locomotive, and it started heating buildings, replacing wood. And we started seeing right around here a little jump up a blip, but we see a sharp rise. And then, about 1900, we discovered you can take oil. And with oil, you can make gasoline and diesel fuel, and you can fire a combustion engine. And at cold, we figured out how to make electricity. So we started burning lots more coal to generate electricity. And we started doing transportation with gasoline engines. And then in the next few years, the last 120, that number has shot up. Ginormous. Ginormous, ginormous. This graph is often called the hockey stick plot, with the resemblance to a very sharp rise. And this is how we know that CO2 is a problem, because this corresponds directly with the rise of the temperatures that we see. And this is why we know it comes from man. So if you want to ever talk to a naysayer who says, well, yeah, but we've had numbers going up and down for a long time. How do we know that this is really not just natural? We can take a look back, not 10,000 years, let's take it back, come on, a million years. Put it, do it for a million years, and we still see the hockey stick. If you did this to 10 million years, you'd still see a hockey stick. You'd have to go back hundreds of millions of years before you see variations in numbers that are much higher at times when actually it was too warm or too cold for humans to live. So this is why we know that CO2 and greenhouse gases are a problem and why we have to decarbonize. 
So at this point, I'm going to. No, we got a couple more here. Um, so temperatures are going up. Temperatures are only going up a little bit. The average temperature on the Earth since about 1800 has only gone up one and a half to two degrees. Not that much. But you hear numbers, oh, we need to worry about a two degree temperature rise, a two and a half degree temperature rise, because that balance was really careful. And in the last hundred years or so that we've gone up that one degree Fahrenheit, one and a half, when we go back to 1800, we have seen huge changes in weather. Our climate is kind of time average, space average, but we see changes in weather. We see more hot heat waves. We see more cold waves. We see more floods. We see more hurricanes. We see more tornadoes. We see wildfires coming from the droughts and the winds. And all that is because of that little bit of CO2 extra that we have, that balance that we've created that creates an energy imbalance that changes the temperature. When you change the temperature a little bit, the polar ice caps melt, which changes sea levels, but it also changes the reflection of sunlight at the poles, which changes the energy balance. Extra CO2 in the atmosphere creates extra CO2 in the oceans, because there's a balance there, which changes the acidity, which changes the plant life. It also changes the jet flows of the natural circulation of the oceans, which changes the jet flows of the natural circulation of the air, which changes how much time our air spins over the poles and then coming down, which gives us polar vortices and heat waves and tornadoes and hurricanes and floods and droughts because of that balance. So that's why we have to decarbonize. If we look and see where the CO2 that's going up, this extra stuff that's man-made, where it comes from, we know that it comes from basically four places. Transportation, industry, this is the thing that started driving things. Up until about 1900 or so, and actually early in the 20th century, people were heating their houses still with wood and they didn't have gas ovens and they didn't have electricity. But as we got electricity, buildings became a place where we have natural gas and we're burning and they're using electricity for other things. So the other big thing is the generation of electricity. If we break down who's emitting CO2 as a percentage, it's about 37% is transportation. It's the biggest hunk. 20% is industry. Buildings are only 12%, but Electricity generation is 32%. So you might say, why do we care about buildings that much? Let's worry about everything else. Well, buildings overwhelmingly use our electricity. Right now, the transportation industry is using less than 1% of the electricity. So don't worry about it as far, at this point, as far as thinking about where it's coming from. This is, this is emissions all from, from diesel fuel and gasoline. But industry has a mix a little bit of coal, mostly natural gas, for processes like making steel and making plastics um, and making concrete. That goes into buildings. And buildings heat and cool with gas and electricity. And all our electronics and all our lights use electricity. So if we take all this electricity and say, it isn't a use by itself, it's gotta go somewhere, we spread it out, we see that buildings are really close to transportation as the cause of our CO2 emissions because of the electricity that it draws. So as we look at this, this helps us figure out when we talk about decarbonizing, why it's important to decarbonize buildings. But if we go between these two graphs, that also tells us we need to decarbonize electricity because so much of it goes into buildings. If we can decarbonize electricity and we can do even more on buildings to use more electricity and less natural gas. We can decarbonize both things at the same time. That also tells you why we need to decarbonize, or we need to go to electric vehicles. If we decarbonize electricity, not an easy goal, but doable. If we do that, and we get industry to use more electricity, and transportation to use more electricity, we take care of those problems all at the same time. So when you hear electrification, and decarbonization, and you hear them together, there's a reason. 
And with that, um, I think we'll go ahead and let you pick up the right. Chicago Building Decarbonization Policy Working Group. 53 stakeholders across all sorts of sectors to develop an equitable building decarbonization strategy for the city. And this took place, uh, geez, this was, um, we initially started in 2020, right before COVID, great time to start something like this. And then we conducted all of our work, all of our conversations online in 2021. Um, work to then document everything in a report that came out last year. So this is a definition that we came up with, which is transitioning buildings from burning natural gas, propane, or oil, while increasing reliance on electric powered systems and appliances. Now notice it doesn't say all buildings, it doesn't say every single system, it's just a, a general definition. So why do we want to do this? I feel like Ralph already explained it quite well, um, but I will go over some, some key points here. So uh, you recall the percentages that he showed, and this is really getting at that. Um, what we, what, how we defined it in, in um, a 2017 inventory of our emissions is that 24% of Chicago's emissions comes from transportation, 7% um, come from waste, and all of the rest of it is associated with what's happening in buildings, 69% of it. So the majority of our emissions comes from buildings. And so the focus being able to reduce our emissions, we have to really address buildings. We have to uh, address transportation too, uh, as Ralph pointed out, you know, we, we really need to do that as well. Yeah, that's, um, a, that's a different workshop. <laughs> yeah, well, we can talk about it. Um, but yeah, we could, yeah. It, it, I think I feel like that one's a little easier because we all see the electric vehicles around town that are really slick, so it makes it easy to like them. Um, the challenge, of course, is how do we do that while also getting the charging stations and the infrastructure in place? There's gas stations everywhere. There are not currently charging stations everywhere, and unless you're going to put one in at home, you know, what are you going to do? So that, but that's another conversation. We will talk a little bit about it. Just, just touch on it. 
So why are we focusing on electricity? Again, um, some of this is explained, but we know, you know, we're in a climate crisis right now as the hockey stick uh, effect. Our, our emissions are going up. We are rapidly seeing changes. If you think about, if, how many of you here are from the Midwest in Chicago in general? Just about everybody? Yeah, so you, you and, and I'm not gonna ask anybody their age, but I know when I think back, uh, in spring and summer, like the seasons are changing. It's different. It's not. It's not super drastic. We haven't had that many drastic events, relatively. But it it is different, and it's changing. And we're having um, longer warm seasons. Uh, the first frost is starting to come later. Our growing seasons are even being impacted by this. So we are seeing these differences. And as we and and. and having more 90 degree heat days, we're having longer duration of heat days. And so this is going to continue to happen if we don't do anything. Um, we, the 2022 Climate Action Plan for the city, um, again, released last year, we set an interim goal. It was not a, 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 it's still a huge goal to reduce emissions by 62%, but it's not the inspirational goals you hear, we're going to be net zero by 2050. It's it's like, here's what we think we can do if we really go hard. Um, and it's an, meant to be an interim goal that we strive for. And then when we do another plan update, we'll see if we can ramp up that goal. Um, but we know that it, part of the reason we focus on electricity, electricity is the, the grid is getting cleaner. There is, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's getting cleaner. There's more renewable sources. There's much less coal. Um, and so that uh, electricity is just cleaner. Um, at the building level, we know that electricity use can also be offset by solar, solar panels on roofs. So that's an opportunity that we don't get with natural gas. Whether it's natural gas, oil is not as so common here, um, more so on the East Coast, but propane, when you get to the further reaches of even our region, there's a lot of propane use. These are all fossil fuels with emissions that they just can't be fully mitigated like electricity. There's an opportunity to do so with electricity. So let's talk a little bit about the benefits. Besides just the climate action, the reducing of the reduction of emissions, um, we spoke a little bit about natural gas stoves, that there is a real opportunity um, to, reduce, to improve the indoor air quality and associated health outcomes. Um, there have been a lot of studies, you might have even heard them on the news, and. Of course, it's gotten very political. Don't take my stove from me. Don't take my gas stove. Um, but we know that um, if we can if we can remove natural gas from homes as much as possible, we know that we can um, help uh, alleviate and even in some cases eliminate respiratory problems. There are numerous studies. I did not post a link in here, but if you just Google it, um, you will see the the recent studies that show. Uh, the impact on indoor air quality. Um, it's, it's the same nitrogen, um, nitrogen dioxide that we measure and is actually regulated in outdoor air, but it's not regulated in indoor air yet. Um, and so this is, this is basically um, touching on that. One of the other benefits um, to addressing building decarbonization is if done right, if done in a manner that you're able to reduce costs, um, and, and I'll, well, I'll touch on what I mean in that is, is really you, you want to go in, you don't want to just go in and electrify everything without addressing energy efficiency, because if you do so, you might actually end up spending more uh, on your energy costs. And so you have to, you can't just go in and electrify. You need to make sure you're doing a comprehensive retrofit where you're addressing the efficiency, you're addressing the building envelope, you're, you're um, assessing the whole building to make sure you're reducing consumption while also electrifying. And when you do that, there's a real good chance that you're going to um, reduce energy costs. Um, I would say never, unless you just don't care about the cost, but I would say you never want to go about electrifying any sort of building without a full energy assessment. So you get the full picture before you take any action. But what's important to note here, and you see the darker shades of purple, is that over 20% of Chicago households um, are facing some level of energy burden. 
Um, and that is a map that comes out of the Climate Action Plan, um, but it's also sourced from, there's a link here that sources directly to the um, external report that's citing that. Um, related to energy costs, um, at a broader community scale, when we're increasing energy efficiency and electrifying buildings and tapping into renewable energy sources, we're also making them resilient against rising energy costs and climate change overall. And this really helps keep buildings better maintained, it helps reduce operating costs, and thereby it's, it's really preserving the beautiful housing that we have in Chicago, preserving affordable housing. Um, and lastly, another um, added benefit, besides the climate action benefits, is being able to um, accelerate the green economy. Construction and other trade unions have long been established as the backbone of our of our community, especially of our economy here in Chicago. And diversifying the workforce and assuring not just job training and skills building, but economic development opportunities for career development and business, even business planning is, is a really important element. If we're going to address the climate emergency with the sense of urgency that is really needed, there are enough jobs and room for everyone to be a part of this green, green revolution. That's engineers, Builder, builders and trade specialists, um, focuses on HVAC, um, energy efficiency, electricians in general, electric supply, so all the utility workers, renewable energy experts, and then let's not forget, in a, in a city like Chicago, where our buildings and our homes, I mean, I live in a, a building that's over 100 years old, a lot of us probably do, um, there's a lot of deferred maintenance, and so there's even opportunity just in basic constructions. Because you can't put solar on a roof that needs repair. You can't, you, you might need to take care of some envelope issues. Or even just to do basic construction, you might have some code stuff that you had nothing to do with, but if you're going to go all out and do a comprehensive retrofit, the building department is going to make you do those, those upgrades so that you're um, adhering to code. So there's a lot of potential work opportunities. And then, you know, these are the ones we talk about a lot. But what other folks have not necessarily been thinking about are specialized workforces kind of associated with, with this work. And those that are trained to co do comprehensive whole building retrofits. Oftentimes, on a retrofit project, I know I've worked on some projects with, with, the, with Elevate, where I used to work with Yami. And we bring in, you know, for a comprehensive retrofit, we bring in the mechanicals team. We bring in the weatherization team. We bring in a, ge a general contractor. So even as people start thinking about comprehensive businesses that offer all of these things in, in one sort one business, that's a real opportunity to, to capitalize on um, as we start to um, add more people to the workforce. Another um, interesting piece to this is um, the specialized workforce around all of the tax incentives and utility incentives that are out there, there's a, there's a strong need for finance um, experts um, in that space. And education, research and development, there's so many um, ancillary opportunities in this space. So how can we pursue building decarbonization? Um, just going to this, this is um, work that came out of the, uh, the, the task force, the working group. And it, these aren't, this is not rocket science. These are the main ways that we can achieve, this is a broad-based yeah, building uh, decarbonization uh, strategy. Every building is not going to be able to electrify, whether it's due to cost or the type of industry or whatever. Um, but these are the four kind of buckets that, that we identified in that process. One, of course, the most obvious is new construction. We should be building that way from the beginning. And, and, and as much as we can, that's what we should be doing. But that's still a small percentage of buildings in Chicago. You know, all of these buildings that are 100 years old, these buildings have been here for 100 years. Stuff that was built 15, 20 years ago and not very efficient, that stuff's gonna be here another 100 years, at least. So we also need to be thinking about how are we using energy? How are the buildings performing? Are we using energy as efficiently as possible? Is the envelope tightened up? 
Um, are we, you know, are the systems within the home, you know, we heard a lot about LEDs years ago. That's old news. Lighting is great, and but they're easy wins, and we need to get into the systems of the home. Is the, is the HVAC as efficient as possible, or did you cut corners? Um, oftentimes when we, you know, the furnace goes out, and you're like, oh my gosh, it's a month before Christmas, let me get this one, and I'll, you know, and, and then we get the cheaper one that has the lesser efficiency, and we pay for it later on down the line. Um, so that's really, you know, addressing the efficiency of the home. And then there's the opportunity for renewable energy. Mostly in Chicago, um, that's going to be, you know, rooftop solar. But there are other opportunities, and there's some, actually, Blacks and Green, who's here today, was just awarded a huge, a huge grant um, to do a pilot on geothermal, um, which uh, I'm not even going to try to explain it, but if you want it. Can, can I... Can you can you yeah, give a ten, ten second commercial on geothermal? Ah, so okay. Or, well, we can talk sixty about this second. Minute. Okay. No, no, we can we can get that to it. Okay. Because after you go through this, uh, if people want to actually know yeah. how it of course yeah we can talk about geothermal. And I did not delve deeply into heat pumps here. And then lastly is the electrification. When it's possible, can we remove? You know, do we instead of um, a natural gas furnace, can we have an air source heat pump? Can we have geothermal? Can we have these other things that are not relying on natural gas? Can we take, can we take that um, gas stove out um, and, and put in an induction cooker? Now I know people are like, oh my gosh, I cannot do without this nat natural, I, I, I gotta have that blue flame. But if I, I'm telling you, test out the induction cooktops. Um, but on the flip side, don't put it in unless you know that your home can, uh, can you can actually have it. Um, because that's another challenge is that many of our homes through their age are going to require an electric panel upgrade, which is not cheap. And you need to also, like I actually had it looked at in my home, and I swap out for this super duper nice um, stove and oven, and they were like, well, your panel can handle it, but we need to wire through this wall, this wall, this wall, this wall, this wall. This wall. And that's going to be about you know, whatever. So I was like, all right, I'll have to figure that out later. Not today. But at least I know, you know, and I didn't actually go out and buy it and feel stupid um, for doing so. But anyway, so these are the different pathways. And it's going to take an all hands on deck approach to be able to reduce our emissions significantly in Chicago. Um, so let's talk a little bit about building decarbonization, because there's a lot of myths, a lot of rumors out there. So we'll talk about it and, and maybe what you've heard, and I'll try to give a, a good example of maybe why what you heard is not exactly correct. So one of the first ones, this one um, you hear a lot, and it's, oh, you know, heat pumps are great, but the, Chicago is too cold. We have cold winters. This is not going to work. This is not correct. Um, where at a time it may have been correct, there have been significant advances in technology over the last 10 years or so. And there are many field tested success stories in places like Alaska, which is not even on here, Maine, Minnesota, New York, and uh, I have Chicago on here twice. So. All over Canada. Yeah, all over Canada, they're doing it. And so um, I even have a picture in a minute, oh, in the next slide, I think. Um, from Chicago, um, City of Chicago, and Elevate National Renewable Energy Laboratory uh, is we're in Comet. We're all partners on a project that's funded by um, Department of Energy to prove that concept here in Chicago. And so, a bunch of um, I'll just go to the next slide. This is Miss Norma. She lives in West Lawn. She got heat pumps for her two flat um, and is having. You know, a, a, it, it's working. It's heating her home. She wasn't cold in the winter. And bonus, she got, with heat pumps, you get air conditioning, which is um, super, it's, it's a nice add-on um, in Chicago homes. And you may not know that Chicago uh, building stock has a higher than average amount of homes that don't have air conditioning. And so as our temperatures are rising, and we know that those rising temperatures impact um, certain populations more, whether they're young 
for the elderly or those with respiratory conditions like myself, like we, that air conditioner is so important when you get into those 90 degree days, especially when we have a longer duration like that. But let me just go back really quick um, and just know this is so exciting to read this, that at the end of 2022, this is the first time in the U.S. where heat pump sales surpassed natural gas furnaces. That is huge, 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 huge. Um, and so I think that trend is only gonna go up and you're gonna continue to see that. Come back to me at the end of this year if that is not the case and then you can tell me I was wrong. But I don't see how that is, that's gonna change um, that much. So that's Ms. Norma. I was hoping to try to see if we could get her here today, but that didn't happen. Um, she was actually on another webinar with us last fall. Um, so myth number two, the electric grid is dirty. And you know, we have coal. Are we just swapping one carbon intensive resource for another? Well, what do you think? Anyone? False. On trend, um, we know that the grid is getting cleaner. It's not perfect. It's definitely not perfect. Um, but we have increasing amounts of renewable production happening on the coast. And here's a map that shows where solar is and solar and wind. We have a lot of hydro in the Northwest. I think folks are probably aware of that already. And on top of that, we know that again in 2022 was a banner year that renewable generation exceeded generation from coal for the first time ever. We would expect that trend to continue as well. There may be jumps here and there, but we expect that to continue. Myth three, the grid's not gonna be able to take off. We can't possibly electrify our buildings and add all these cars and the grid break down. Well, that's actually false too. Grid modernization is ongoing. It's continuing, it's been happening. Um, there may be pockets where things need to continue to be upgraded, but they are on a continual plan to upgrade. And as we know, the generation mix continues to shift towards cleaner uh, sources. We don't have to wait to start. Um, the, the truth of the matter is, is that um, we don't have to wait until the grid is mostly renewable. Um, and with climate, the climate emergency before us, it's really, we really have to start and ramp up. It's slow going now anyway, um, but we have to, there's too much work to be done and too many buildings that we have to, to reach that if we wait until the grid is all the way or like majority renewable, it's, 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 the action is, is too late. Myth number four, it, co it costs too much money. How can we pay for this? Now this is, this is I, I'm, I'm gonna call this one a false, but it, it, it's, it's challenging. So yes, if you're about to write a check today, right now, and say, I'm gonna pay for my full retrofit of my home, it might, depending on what you're doing, it might be 20,000 to $50,000. That's a lot of money, I don't have 20,000. But what is the game changer here is federal policy. Who's heard of the Inflation Reduction Act? Have most people heard of it by now? Yeah. So this is, again, this is a real game changer. It's rebates for low to moderate income households. Off the front, you get a rebate off of so many different things, and I'm gonna give you some resources in a minute. But that is money that you don't even, doesn't even come out of your pocket. And on the back end, is tax incentives. So you get a write-off essentially every single year after this for these incentives, for the things that you install in your home. There are significant utility incentives. I didn't include, I did include the slide that talks about each of them. Some of them are still being worked out. Um, and whether that's whether it's with Con Ed or if you are, let's say you're not electrifying and you're putting in the best furnace that you can put in, there's, there's incentives at, at people's gas as well. Um, there are also, if you do go all electric, there are lower utility rates for all electric heating. And then, of course, you've probably heard people say, well, solar is much cheaper and it's getting cheaper. That's true. There's economies of scale, whether it's solar or heat pumps or any of that. that as we continue the production of those things, those, and, and the workforce keeps broadening and there's not, there's, five contractors that are, and I'm exaggerating, 
that there's not just five contractors at your disposal to, to, to work with, but as, as there are more contractors and there's, and, the, and as the supply chain continues to work itself out, these costs are going to continue to go down too. So there, we're in a time right now that it, it's really unprecedented in terms of the federal and local opportunities for, for doing um, this kind of work in your home or your commercial building. And what I should also note about the Inflation Reduction Act, it's, it's in my opinion, groundbreaking, is it's not just homes and small businesses. Even local government and nonprofits who don't pay taxes can take advantage of that. And that is huge. That, that You don't see that. Um, you haven't seen that in, in the uh, past. So I'll try to quickly go over what the city of Chicago has been up to, and then we'll talk about some next steps and what's your game plan. So with um, city of Chicago, um, we know that there is historic inequities within, you know, that are deep in, across our community in Chicago, and particularly in our black and brown neighborhoods. Um, as we strategically act to address our growing climate crisis, we have to approach this work upholding the values of equity and justice. We have to reckon with the legacy of systemic issues that have led to these disparate conditions. And we have to remove, we have to focus on removing barriers for all Chicagoans in order for, to them, for them to participate and realize not just the environmental benefits of climate action, but the co-benefits that we talked about. And to experience economic inclusion and savings Reduce pollution burden, um, particularly in, in certain neighborhoods we know that are more polluted than others. Um, equitable access to critical infrastructure and community health and resiliency. So this is a little roadmap with some key dates. Um, even before this, Chicago had um, one of the first big city um, climate action plans in the U.S. Not nationally, I mean not internationally, but in 2008. Um, and then a voluntary program called Retrofit Chicago started, and it's still around, but um, it's, it, it's being uh, kind of reformed. reformed. Um, the benchmarking ordinance, which requires all buildings over 50,000 square feet to report their energy use, which is a, a first step. It's not, it's all it is, is report your energy use. That's it. But it's something. Um, that was adopted, uh, I believe, under Rahm Emanuel's, um, yeah, it was under his administration in 2013 and it went into effect starting in on a rolling basis in 2014. Well, let's fast forward to um, October 2021. Um, as part of the Chicago Recovery Plan, and I'll talk about it again uh, in a minute, I'll show a little bit more about it, um, the City Council approves a budget that includes over $188 million in a in one single climate investment. It's the largest one-time investment that the city has made. Um, fast forwarding into spring 2022, a divestment ordinance for um, natural gas, um, use it for, for um, investing in companies. Um, and then the, the updated climate action plan and later that spring, and then a lot of action towards the end of last year. Um, the city, had, announced its energy supply agreement. We are building um, the, I believe, the second largest um, solar farm, municipal solar farm. Um, it's down in Sagamon County, and it will um, help the city achieve its 100% renewable um, energy supply for municipal buildings by 2025. Um, and then we adopted the energy transformation code, which is baby steps towards a more in-depth new construction code that looks at um, having requirements around solar readiness and a few other things. And then lastly, the working group, the task force, released its report, which I would encourage all of you to take a look at the various building decarbonization recommendations and policy um, suggestions that come out of that, because those are really um, where the next steps where you'll see um, city policy heading in that direction. So that's these two documents if you wanted to take a look at your resources in earlier slides. So quickly about that $188 million. Again, it's part of the Chicago Recovery Plan, which has both federal dollars and bond dollars. Um, and there are 
four areas that I will point out um, within that. There are, um, and I'll just go to the next slide. So among the four areas, there is an uh, energy set of projects that are related to decarbonization. Um, we have two of them are focused on multifamily decarbonization and working with existing buildings, uh, affordable housing that are in the existing portfolio with the Department of Housing. And then soon we'll have an RFP um, for those of you that may be interested that's coming out for a single family and two to four unit um, program that will focus heavily on decarbonization and being able to give grants out to homeowners and um, uh, building owners of two to four units. We have another RFP that's coming out um, also soon, within the next couple of months, a month or two, um, for five million to run a, a similar program for community anchor institutions or nonprofits. And then we're also putting solar on libraries and eventually, uh, hopefully later this year, we're gonna have another RFP for community solar. Are people familiar with what community solar is? Community solar is basically, you know, you live in an apartment building, you can't put solar on your apartment, but you can tap into the resources of an external uh, solar uh, system. And then there's um, a couple of other areas where we're working on green infrastructure, or basically nature-based solutions to reduce urban flooding and, and stormwater runoff. We are, have a significant investment in, um, we're gonna be planting 75,000 trees over the next five years. We actually planted almost 20,000 last year alone. Um, and these are being targeted in areas where the tree canopy is um, lowest in the city. And can you guess where the lowest tree canopy is? In our black and brown communities, no surprise. Um, and then um, lastly, there's a host of community um, and infrastructure projects that include um, some city things that are including fleet electrification um, and kicking that off, but then also um, uh, some green, more green infrastructure actually um, along the Calumet River and um, a few other projects in there uh, related to transportation, composting, so a wide range of projects that are going on at the city. Um, so those are some of the things that we're working on. We saw a whole lot, so I would encourage, you know, I have my contact information. If you, if any of those pique your interest and you want to learn a little bit more about a specific project, I'm happy to talk to you about it. And if I can't give you all the answers, I can point you to the person in the department that I'm working with to, to give more answers. Um, but I think what I'd like to, and I know I've just been yammering away, talking about, um, thinking about building decarbonization. We really all have a role, whether you're thinking about electrifying or you feel that draft in your, by your window like I do when it's really cold and you want to address that or your furnace is 20 years old and oh my gosh, I better do something before it does me in. You know, so like want to think about what are you thinking about and, and really, um, Encouraging you to think scale and impact. What can you do at home? What's your roadmap? And on the right, um, this is an amazing resource. We don't have to, there's organizations out here who are doing this hard work. We don't have to be communications experts, and I am not a communications expert. But this example, if you've heard of Rewiring America, they, their website is so fantastic. There's this guide that you can download. You have to put your email in, and they'll, they don't email you too much, so don't worry about that. But you can get this guide. Uh, it is fantastic, and it walks you through everything you need to know. They have a calculator on the website where you can put in where you live, your income, how many people are in your household, and it'll break down for you an estimate of what you're likely going to be eligible for for the Inflation Reduction Act. So then you can start to think about, well, we know the Inflation Reduction Act is time limited. It's a 10 year thing. So you got 10 years, but that time, we all know 10 years can go really quickly. I, I figured that out. My kid was 17, a minute, I mean, seven a minute ago, and she's like 17. I can't believe it. But like, time goes quick. So think about what's your 10 year plan. What are, you know, and even in this book, they have like, they map out other people, they give examples. 
of different folks and what their situation is, and they map out what their plan is. And then there is a worksheet in here where you can create your own plan. You can start to think about, well, what are the things that I want to do? I think this is a great starting point to even just think about it. Um, because especially if you know you're going to be replacing you know, appliances or your furnace is aging, I keep using that example because that's right there. Uh, but you know, there's all sorts of things that you could be taking advantage of and just with a few tweaks get these incentives um, and also be doing the climate a good favor too. Um, but then more broadly, like what about around the office? What are things you can think of? Now I mentioned that again, this is available to everybody. It's not just these incentives are available to small businesses, nonprofits, local government, unheard of before. So these are really great tools to have, financial incentives. And then lastly, in your community, and I think this to me is probably the most compelling one. Again, this is where not recreating the wheel, but using the resources that are out there are so important. Because there's people that don't, you know, oh, I don't, I don't really care about that environment. I'm not an environmentalist. But how can you mobilize your community? What are the resources that you can share with them? Um, how can you, you know, are there ways to build a, a cooperative, a buying cooperative around these things? <laughs> All sorts of things you can think of and, and use to inform people and utilize the tools that are that are out there, um, like this handy tool, and there's there's many others. But I I'm just a real big fan of um, rewiring America. I believe Stacey Abrams just joined them as executive as CEO or executive director. Um, so yeah, I expect even more great things to come out of there. Um, and there's this I, I could probably have added a resource page, but I didn't. I could do that later. But I think just really starting to think about what your 10 year plan is. And I have talked long enough, way too long, um, but would love to take questions or hear from you all if, if any of you have already started to think about these things or does anything pop into your mind that you might want to think about. Um, and also just to answer any questions. And Mr. Science here is probably the one that can answer like the scientific type questions. And I know you're going to talk about geochemicals. So uh, I guess. Um, you know, one of the questions here that, that I had talked about earlier that I often get is, okay, we're, we're going to go ahead and, and try to remove natural gases and heating and this question about heat pumps, can they work? People are, are just, it's a technology I don't know. So I'm going to go over and we'll skip much of the other stuff I talked about to get up here and actually a little more information about just a couple technologies that we talked about so that maybe you feel a little more comfortable with it. So the first thing actually we'll talk about is induction stoves. Um, when I bought my first house, I lived in Boulder, Colorado, and I had an electric stove and I switched to the gas. And it was because I grew up on an electric stove with a coil. I just wanted more control. I started cooking a lot. Um, we're I doing it today. I would change my mind <laughs> because induction stoves are not your mama's old coil. Um. <clears throat> so we can, as this thing goes through, um, I did unfortunately have to replace my electric stove. At the beginning of COVID, my, uh, or I shouldn't say electric stove, my gas stove with another gas stove. At the beginning of COVID, mine broke. I was stoveless. And I needed to get an electrical upgrade to do the induction stove. So this is one of those things that takes some time. But the way that an induction stove works, so that you can kind of get an idea, we'll wait till it cycles through here. But it starts out with electricity that creates uh, electricity that goes through a coil, but that creates an electromagnetic field. And what that does is it actually creates electric currents that go around in the pan. There is no heating up of this element. There's no heating up. The pan itself just heats up. And when that heats up, it then puts the heat just as if there had been a flame or an electric coil. The neat things about this is you can crank this up and down just like a gas stove. But there's no emissions. There's nothing 
combusted. So the air quality that you get out of an induction stove is fantastic. It's just like an electric stove, but it responds instantaneously. And this is actually more efficient than any gas or any electric core. So you will use less energy. You'll have something that is more responsive than either gas or electric, and it's much safer. That whole top that this sits on is cool. When it's cool, not only can you have a smooth top, it doesn't have stuff that bakes on. So when your stuff boils over, and that sticky honey sauce that you had that would hit your gas top and stick, and you know how hard it is to scrub this off. I don't have to tell you. That doesn't happen anymore. It cleans off really nice. You have to do some planning. But if you talk to anybody who's done the conversion to induction, nobody wants to go back. The same way if you had an electric coil and went to gas, you don't want to go back and you make that. And you can actually test this out by buying a single burner. They're available for $70 to $100 in test or not. You do need to make sure you've got pans at hand. If you can stick a magnet to your pan, it works. Cheap old cast iron works awesome on induction. Um, stainless steel works great. So, the, uh, in the building decarbonization report from the, from the task force, one of the um, strategy ideas was this level of engagement where people could go somewhere besides an appliance store, go to, you know, and there's a talk about a building decar hub where people could test it out and see for themselves how it, again, it's not your old coil, that it is very, you know, it's very easy to use um, and it actually is so much better than the gas. And I think um, having those sorts of um, tester sites um, it combined with, I think it was Naomi's idea to have like certain industry, certain restaurant industry sites test it out and show and make it available to consumers to see it in action, that there would be a shift in thought. And that it's just kind of an old behavior that we have that, that, that we need to rethink. And so I, I didn't want to, I just want oh, to. No. That's great. Actually, I think the idea of a demonstration site is fantastic. So the other thing is this heat pump. You hear this term a lot, and it's a really key part of us being able to remove natural gas in the form of boilers. In my house, I have a 1922 Chicago bungalow that has been worked on. I live in Oak Park, but um, it's got hot water heat that my boiler is 30 years old. I've got this plan now. Well, but it lasts 35. I got five minutes, so I'm working on it. Um, but you all know what a heat pump is. If you have a refrigerator, you have a heat pump. If you have an air conditioner already, you have a heat pump. Now we just have to think about how is it I can use this. You know, so you can think about, I have an air conditioner. Okay, I know how that works. I know how a refrigerator works. Or maybe you know it works. But a heat pump isn't magic. And I actually will tell you how it works. <laughs> so, so we can start out a heat pump. If you think about your refrigerator or your air conditioner. You have an inside and you have an outside. I'm gonna tell you how this works for heat. And the whole idea of a heat pump is it grabs heat from one side, or from the outside, and it will dump into your house. You say, how can it do this? It's cold outside and it's hot in my house. And it does come from, it's not magic, it's physics. <laughs> but there's a set of tubing and in, inside here is something called a refrigerator. Now, refrigerants are some of those bad GHG gases we talked about earlier. But it's really little bits, and refrigerators don't leak that bad. So there's a lot of ways here. The myth is, oh, we're just going to get rid of, of natural gas and we'll just have problems with the refrigerators. See, even if all the refrigerators leak, it isn't as bad as what we have from natural gas. But the, the idea here is two magic parts, this thing called an expansion valve and a compressor, which is just a pump. So there's fluid in here in the form of refrigerant that is actually, at this point, it's a gas. And when it goes through a compressor, the compressor heats up. By compressing it, makes it, uh, increases the pressure, which heats it up. And you make sure you heat it up so it's hotter than the inside of your house. And then you put that hot refrigerant, you pump it through a coil, it's a radiator, and if you have hot gas that goes through the coil, it's going to heat up your room. Okay? So now you have this hot gas. As it goes through your room, it cools off a little bit. Then it goes through this little piece of magic called an expansion valve. And it looks like this because literally it's something that next down 
and expands. When your podcast goes through that expansion valve, the magic of physics, it's not magic, it's just physics, that gas expands very quickly and it cools off enormously. If you designed it right and you have the pressures and the flow right, you can make it so that it's colder than the outside air. This actually turns into a liquid. It goes through this thing called an evaporator, and as it goes through the evaporator, it picks up heat. Actually, went through here. It picks up heat from the outside. If you design it right, it's colder than the outside air. Even if it's 10 degrees, minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit, this, this liquid is now colder than the outside. It will pull in heat. We put it in the compressor that takes the liquid and pressurizes it and actually turns it into a warm gas again, and the cycle goes around. It takes much less energy because of the expansion and this compression to heat up that little bit of refrigerant when it goes through that liquid to gas than it would just trying to heat up with an electric wire or using a gas burner. So you have a system here that can use that can move heat from outside to inside, five times as much heat as you put in for electricity. It seems like it's magic, but you're not actually generating heat directly. You're moving it from the inside to the outside. And that same system can turn around and it becomes an air conditioner. It goes the opposite direction. This pump can just flip itself around. And so that same system that was providing heat in the summer provides air conditioning in the winter. That's how heat works. We talked about, you are talking about how we need to be thinking about this and not wait 20 years. This is a little set of numbers of why we need to start doing it now and not wait till the grid is cleaned up. Right now, we just mentioned that the number of new, of new heat, the heat pump sales outpace furnaces, but that's mostly for new construction. When we look right now, there's still 100 million homes in the US without heat pumps. And we're doing about 500,000 conversions per year, which means if we want to convert those 100 million homes, it'll take 200 years. If we wait 20 years to start, it's still going to take 200 years. We need to start now, now, <laughs> now, and ramp up that number so we're getting millions of conversions a year so that we can try to get conversion over the next 10, 20, 30 years. This means workforce development, workforce training, something that's going to help out a lot of equity situation in terms of creating a new workforce. That has to be local. You can't outsource a job of installing and maintaining a heat pump. I guess, I think just to summarize everything you just said, Lindy, before, decarbonization can be a win. A win-win. It's not just win. It's better for the environment. It's going to be better for the pocketbook. And it finally can actually provide equity and justice. When we have incentive program that you talked about, it's being targeted at 40% of the benefits are supposed to go to at-risk communities, disadvantaged communities. That's a minimum of what the benefits are supposed to be. If you look at how the incentives are set up and when community organizations and utilities work together, which is what the organizations that we're talking about, the elevates of the world are helping to do, we can do a transition that is going to be affordable for people over the long run. I think there's still lots of potential financing mechanisms that need to come up to, to help the first cost, um, but if we can get over that hurdle, this is, this is a no-brainer for everybody, because everybody can do it. Questions, please. Yeah, you're, you, you are brave enough to sit in front, so you get to. <laughs> okay, well, thank you both. That was all, like, you build a really strong case for your case for why it's a great step. My mind, personally, I just went to my, like, I live in an apartment as a landlord and rent property management company, and I can look up all these, like, grants and money that exists or, or do you know if we're going 
solutions to those types of uh, housing setups? So, yeah, you definitely bring up a good point, and I think that's what they call split incentives when the uh, owner of the building would be putting paying for the things that presumably the tenants are benefiting from. So there are programs that are um, meant to address that, and there are opportunities for low interest loans. Um, there are also incentives at the utility scale on both sides, as natural gas and um, of electricity um, for that. I think, um, I don't know, Yami, can you talk, uh, I hate to put you on the spot, but I know you do a lot of engagement. Um, do you, how, how, like, if, if, because you're a tenant, you can't take that on, but how do, and, I, and maybe you don't know the answers, but how do you bring um, a building owner into that conversation? I know there's certainly mechanisms for mm -hmm. ones that are in um, low to moderate income areas, but if you're talking about, um, you know, maybe an area that's a little bit more affluent, um, is there, are there, there's certainly incentives they can take part in, but is there outreach that's happening in those communities as well? Thank you. Um, so, yes and no. I would say yes, there are incentive uh, programs for multifamily buildings. Currently, most of them are uh, being managed by the utility companies where you live. So your landlord could appeal to ComEd if it was gas. They would get into the multifamily efficiency program as a first step to help sort of with that envelope. Um, there's also incentives for income eligible uh, multifamily buildings with solars through Illinois Solar for All. Um, and there's more work to be done in that we, we're doing outreach because there's a lot of people to reach, right? So it's like a, a capacity issue, right? We need more capacity to get the word out and to educate people, like we just said through today. Um, and then it's also a bit disjointed, meaning you go over here for one thing, you go over there for another thing. There's a lot of different programs under different funding um umbrellas, and unfortunately, there are going to be more. There's going to be more of that with CJA, with you know, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, right? So having a hub, right, one place where people can go to get all that information would be extremely helpful because currently it's very digital. A hub and also awareness. Oftentimes those things aren't addressed until there's a problem. And then it becomes an emergency. Um, but if you have the information in advance, and you're ready for it, and you know what you're going to do when that boiler breaks down or whatever. Like that, that there's you're already informed. Actually, I was going to say, um, you're living. Yeah, you are living in an apartment. You're not living in an apartment that necessarily needs a larger retrofit. That may be part of with lots of other incentives because of of your income or where you're located. But your apartment still needs repair. They still have to replace the boiler or the furnace. Now, that happens on a 20-year cycle, or if it's a boiler, it could be a few more years. And your electric stove still needs replacement when it breaks. Those are the times when, when things can happen. Now, I think the key thing here is planning, that if you know what the cycle is coming up, you as a larger company is going to be looking to take advantage and stack up the incentives so that they are not just responding immediately. So it's, I think actually um, the multifamily apartments can be a leader when it comes to some of the lower income buildings and, and subsidized buildings, and the other apartment buildings are gonna be a follower. So I think you're gonna be stuck as a follower for a little while. There are programs for market rate buildings though, so it's not like, it's not like yeah. yeah, I know like in those smaller like subways, yeah. <laughs> like the fire is not burning. Okay. Yeah, the question second. Yeah, okay. yeah. I had a question back to the defunct. So 
also the delivery system. So I understand the whole coil concept, but is this coming out in, like, for example, the furniture has a forced air to blow and the radiator has a radius in it. How is it radiating? So, okay, yeah. So, so there's two different ways. If you're replacing a gas furnace, for example, that has forced air, you would, you would likely have a centralized heat pump that just replacing the furnace would go into your furnace system and blow. Um, so you would have your, your you forced air, your forest, your forest air, yeah, correct. You use the shell in the ductwork. That's one way. That's called an air-to-air -air heat source pump, and it's focused on a furnace retrofit. So, it's really yeah. so does the actual conduction unit sit inside of that, or is it separate? So yeah, so you would have one unit that would still be outside, okay. and then the other unit is next to or takes the place of where the where a furnace is, and the motor would still have a blower. There is alternatively, even if you have duct work, what are called mini splits, in which case you would have a small one of those heating cooling units where the heat goes into our other room in every room. And in fact, if you have like my case baseboard heat, that is hot water. It is likely that I would get these mini splits. So I will have have five, six, seven of these in each and every room. So it's kind of like you can think of window air conditioners that provide heating and cooling in each room. The great thing about that is you can provide an energy efficiency, energy savings by only heating and cooling in rooms that are being used at a given time. There's a lot more flexibility. You have you have more units. Which, you know, it's one of these trade-offs. Well, maybe I have more things that could break. But the flexibility and thermal comfort, just the overall quality of life in a mini-split unit, there's a reason why they are popular all over Europe. They've replaced it. People have not replaced their heat cooling. Yeah. So, because you have localized heat and cooling. That's another option. And in fact, in most older homes, that's usually the preferred option. Like I said, because you don't, you have window air conditioner units like I have. I am really freaking tired of 50 pound air conditioning units up the stairs from the basement. My daughter comes home, seriously, when my daughter comes home now from college, she, she carries it up because I'm getting too old for that stuff. So, so I guess the, the further question is on the same area is because a lot of the buildings in Chicago have that old radiator heat shield, boilers. So if that's the system that's in place, does that have to come out and then replace it with this? Or can that be integrated? Into so, it? yeah, so there's actually work into what are. What, ones that would provide still hot water for, uh, if, it was a, if it's a steam, you want to do a complete refit. But there is there are people working on being able to provide heating, not as efficient cooling, but through that system. And so I'm thinking in my, my baseboard hot water heat, um, I will just get rid of that and do mini splits. Now one of the questions with these mini splits there is research into make this look. So I, I would put it in place of where the radiator sits, but it would be the heat pump system so that it actually doesn't change the look and feel of the building. That's that's still out there in terms of research of those coming to market, but it wouldn't surprise me in five years if that would be available. Yes? Yeah, so my question is, as electricity grids are quickly shifting to renewable energy sources, like solar and wind, um, how do we address, or what is the short-term affordable solution to meet peak demand periods if we want to eliminate natural gas and coal? So, this is not a grid, but I think I can help answer your question. So, it's a threefold thing. The first one is something called demand response, where we voluntarily have owners of buildings, because buildings are one of the most flexible things. No what times. If, if, so I'm on real-time pricing, and although I have solar, <laughs> it's one of, um, I'm on real-time pricing, and I took advantage of that, um, especially when I didn't have my air conditioner running because I didn't want to take it all the way up to that top floor. So, so people and buildings volunteering, whether it's they actually get paid or they get a reduction in rates to to peak shaving at those times. The next thing is storage, and it could be larger scale grid level storage. It could be at the home, um, again, you have a battery that will that will charge up at low times and it provides that peak so that your, your building does not load the system. It kind of turns away from the grid. There is a lot of research going on for both retrofit in houses, a little pack that might be in your garage, could be in your basement. Um, and the third thing then is actually integration of solar as it goes on to your, your rooftop. That, um, 
a lot of the peak time is when there is sun. It's toward the end of the day. So we've got the problem of people coming home and plugging in their electric vehicles that they hope. That's <laughs> that, that's what California is facing. So, actually, but, I was thinking of yeah. California, like how do we avoid another California? The Cal well, the California duck curve problem, so it's, something's called the duck curve because of during the day there's lots of solar energy so the, 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 the need at home goes down. Nobody's at home, but they go home and they turn on their air conditioners and they're plugging in their electric vehicles and the solar basically drops out because the sun's going down. So how do they deal with that? And they're doing it with storage. It's large scale storage. That is a utility. They're the ones who are gonna be working on that. But it doesn't mean that you can't do it in your home and take advantage of the resilience benefits um, and the, the potential pricing situation of you being a common customer who gets peak shaving. If I could just build on that, I think there's actually a fourth option that hasn't been noted as well, utilizing thermodynamics and ice. Probably not a, a you know a, a, a feasible option for residents, uh, but your tall vertical buildings, your large commercial applications, you can use ice for thermal cooling and load shedding, and you can also use ice for heat. You can create heat out of ice, utilizing the heat pump technologies. Okay, we're at time. Can I ask one more, and then we'll then we'll head up. You you were waiting patiently. No, thank you. At the well, first at the risk of sounding cheesy, like I want to thank the city for all the 